Okay, good morning. Um, let's get started. Are there any questions, concerns from what we covered in the last lecture? Right. If not, we can get moving, right? So, is it too loud? Okay. I have a sort of echo here. Um, so let's finish what we were working, looking at the virtual memory, uh, virtual machines before moving on to the, the first module, which is trying to schedule uh, processors, right? So we're going to go through multiple modules. The first one is trying to work with uh, processors. Second one is trying to have the processors co cooperate with each other. Then we look at memory and, and uh, file storage, right? We start with the processor because that's one of the main resources that you use, the main CPU or uh, to computation, right? So we left off with the notion of virtual machines, and virtual machines are becoming a lot more important, uh, mostly because people are finally realizing that it, it gives you some benefits. So one of the things is, the idea here is you create this notion of another machine, right? So it depends on how much you can create this abstraction. But if you do this, then essentially you create a virtual layer where you can run another, another operating system on top of it. So you have an operating system running on top of another operating system. If you can do this with good performance, meaning if you can keep this fast, and if you can keep this layer not bloated, then you should be able to run multiple operating systems on the same machine and not really notice much performance degradation, right? How many of you tried VMware or Zen or one of those um, variants? How many of you, uh, so do you, do you think that the performance is sort of okay enough to use it? Right. So you need the hardware support to make that happen. If you have no hardware support, then, it, then it's very slow because you're running two operating systems on top of each other. So if, if that happens and you don't use it, but the newer processors from Intel and all those things give you virtual machine support. So if, if you do this, the nice thing is you can run two operating systems, right? And the nice thing for, for, for you guys is if you want to do a course project, if you want to do a kernel and something messes up, it's okay because you can run it inside a virtual machine and if it crashes, you just throw it and create a new virtual machine. Your own machine does not crash, right? What ideally people would like to do is put your PowerPoint inside a virtual machine, say I eat say power, uh, virtual machine and so on and so forth. In that case, if there's no way that PowerPoint can crash a machine because PowerPoint can only crash the virtual machine it's running on, not the whole system, right? And this is really useful because like right now I'm running on this machine, right? They let me log into the machine so I could potentially crash, crash this, the lectern PC. So they can do it as a virtual machine, then that won't be a problem. Um, so th there's a lot of effort to make this happen, especially in terms of data centers, right? The, the idea of data center, which we won't talk too much in this class, is rather than us maintaining the computers, like for, for OIT and all those things, you go with these companies, like this Amazon, does a, a S3, Amazon, AOL, all these big companies have data centers, humongous data centers with, with tens of thousands of millions of computers, right? So they can rent those stuff out to you rather than us maintaining those computers. So we can say we want 10,000 computers for something. We want 10,000 computers for our students, 10,000 for processing your grades or what have you. Then Amazon can give you 10,000 computers for how much time you paid for it. And then when you're done, they can take it back, right? So economy of scale works really good. But the problem here is Amazon can do this for everybody else. So in our case, we don't particularly care. But suppose you are Ford, right? And Amazon is also selling to GM. You don't want whatever Ford is running to be accessible to GM, right? And because there are competitors in, in this market. So if you can do this inside a virtual machine, then whatever Amazon gives to you, they don't actually give you a real machine. They only give you a virtual machine. You can do whatever you want with it. You can crash the machines. You can do what have you and your competitor can be running on the same machine, they don't get to see each other's construct, right? The, the other way is to have real machines doing the stuff, which doesn't really work out, right? So Amazon can say, I'll give you 10,000 real machines for you to uh, play with, but that doesn't work out in, in terms of the cost. So, they, so a lot of interest in doing this kind of a stuff, right? So you can do this in your desktop to have multiple operating systems uh, running. The other example you, you might have uh, used is a Java virtual machine, right? When you say JVM, it's really a Java virtual machine, which means that when you write Java code, it's designed to run on a Java operating system running on top of a Java virtual machine, right? You don't run a Java 
machine, Java program to run on the native host, which may be Windows or Linux. You write it to run on a Java operating system running on a Java virtual machine, right? It may not be explicitly told to you before, but that's really what happens, right? So as a program in Java, you do not have access to what the local machine does. You only have access to what Java will give you, and Java may request that from the underlying machine, right? So if, if that translation does not happen, you can't ha get access to it, right? Which is one of the reasons why your graphics may not look as good in Java machine than other ones, because you have to go through this two-level in indirection, right? But the nice thing is when you run a Java machine, there's no way you can harm the machine, right? Because it's just a virtual machine on set under the operating system. You don't have direct access to the machine, right? So, that, so that's one of the reasons why you may see lower performance in Java VM than writing directly on the machine. But the benefit is I can, I can say if you want, so you can run, run your program in my machine under a virtual machine. So I can feel a little safer because you can't destroy my machine. You can't destroy a virtual machine, right? So it's, it's very popular. We'll, we'll see some of it a little bit as you move along. Um, but that, that's the notion of virtual machine, right? So that kind of concludes the, the general notion of what operating system is in, in some sense. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a thing which manages resources. And you have various ways of building these things. And you have to worry about the problem of booting up and how to run this operating system and stuff. And next, we will go into the different modules. And we'll see how, what is the functionality given by the, the operating system. right? And like, like we, we said before, operating systems manage resources. And the primary resources are input, output, memory for whatever it has to do, and the processor, right? Processor is the sort of the brain of the, of the computer. So we'll, we'll focus on how to manage processes, and what, how to manage the, the central processing unit among these different processes, right? Uh, among the different uh, entities. So anyway, the, 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 the slide about virtual machine said what I just talked about. So the, the, to introduce, before I introduce the notion of how to give processors, I mean, CPU and stuff, we have to define a notion of who you are, right? So if you want to run an application called Word, there's this notion of Word as application. But within the operating system, I have to know that you're running something so I can have a representation, so I can do some things with you. So I can say, you are running this program. I can give you memory, and I can, I can take memory away from all those things. So that abstraction is called a process, right? The process is a notion of a program which is running. So if you have a word program, if it's running, you call it a process, right? And you need a notion of process because then the operating system can give you resources. It can give you CPU, it can give you memory, it can give you what have you. It can take it away from you, etc. right? So until a program becomes a process, operating system does not get involved. Of course, operating system is the one which creates this process, but every operation that you want to do to this program has to go through to a process, right? If a program is not running, if a word is sitting in the, pro in the computer, no process is allocated to it. But once it starts to run, you create this notion of a process, and you can give stuff to it, right? And the pro so it, essentially, when you write a C program, when you, when you say a main call, it's up to the operating system to create this process and let you go, right? And it has to give you something. And traditionally, operating system will give you some things which all programs want. You know, they'll give you a stack, it'll give you a heap, and so on and so forth. And you can then later on ask for more, right? So when you start your program, the operating system has to give you enough stuff to get going, and you can ask more stuff, right? For example, it has to give you a stack because the main has a notion of a stack. It has a notion of a local variables and stuff. If it did not give you a stack, you cannot run. So that it, it gives you enough so they can you can start, right? So the notion of so process is the notion of uh, of, of of this. You know, has all the um, it's a program execution, so you can give and take away resources, right? And once you have a process, that means when you start, it's a process, right? But it, it can go through different phases, right? Depending on what it's able to do, right? So the operating system can give it all the resources it wants. But even if it has all the resources, it may not be able to run all the time. It may not be able to proceed, right? For example, if it's waiting for your input, right? If you're, if you're waiting for you to type something on the keyboard, then you may have all the resources it wants, but yet it cannot use anything, any of those, because it's waiting for you as a human being to type something, right? So in that case, the operating system can say, 
okay, you asked for a printer, you asked for a disk, you asked for a screen. I can give you all the stuff. And since you're waiting for the uh, output, I can just wait. I mean, the operating system can just wait, right? But that's not a really useful way to do res use resources. So what you can say is, if you have all the resources, but you're waiting for something, I can move you to a state to say you are waiting for some I/O, right? Rather than keep you in one state where you have all the resources, I can move you to a uh, different state. In which case, I can take away some stuff from you while you're waiting, right? So it has a notion of moving you around different states, just so that it can it can do other stuff, right? So essentially, what happens is when you start a new process, it's it started out as new, right? And then it has to decide whether it should admit you. Right? It has to decide whether you are a process that needs some service right now. So for example, it, it can decide that it, it has enough things to do right now. So it can say, go away. right? So essentially, at some point, it has to decide to let you in. right? It can either decide because it's doing too much, or it can decide because you're going to ask too much. right? So whatever reason, it can decide not to let you in. But once you come in, it can put you in a ready state, meaning you have all the resources that you really have want so you can proceed right but you also define other notion where a notion of running where you have all the resources that you want but you also have the cpu which is the processor resources to do computation right the other the third state is waiting which means that you have you are waiting for something to happen you cannot proceed because you are waiting for input output or what have you right so essentially when you run a program it keeps going between these states and that's, that's the role of the operating system, and that's how it, it manages, right? When it's in running state, that means you have all the resources that you want, all the, all the uh, resources that you need, and you're not waiting for it. Uh, you're running on the processor. You're doing computation. You're, you're, you're doing com uh, numerical computation. At some point, I may decide, you to move, decide to move you to a waiting state without you knowing about it, just because I want to be fair, right? I don't have to do this, but I can do that, right? So essentially here, you're running, but I can decide that you had enough time, you've been running for too long, so I'm gonna take the process from you and give it to somebody else, right? In that case, you are still running, so you still had all the resources, so you'll be in the waiting state, right? Uh, you are not running because I, as operating system, took the stuff away from you, so that's why you have this arrow of going from running to, um, to the wait state, right? which is essentially what we are doing for the homework project one, right? In fairness, operating system has a little timer which goes off every so often, and in this case, you try 110, uh, you know, 10 times a second, 100 times a second, 1,000 times a second, or what have you. So every so often, it comes in and says, okay, you've been running for a while, I'm gonna take the process away from you, give it to somebody else. So it's gonna move you from here to the waiting state, right? If somebody else wants it, it'll move to the waiting state. If nobody else wants it, it'll keep you running, right? And that's that's the, what you're trying to do, changing how often things can move, right? So as you can imagine, if nobody else is running in the system, then you'll get to run all the time. It doesn't matter how often you get interrupted, right? But if there are other people running, then you get moved back and forth between these two, right? I mean, if you looked at the homework project, right? The homework project one, the little program. Essentially, that's what you're trying to do, right? Trying to see how you can see this thing. And many of you may notice that you, you don't actually see like a drastic difference, right? These machines are really fast that you can't really see much of a difference, but you'll see some indication of the difference because the machines are so fast that regardless of what you can do, it just streams along, right? Those machines were supposed to be the 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 the, the not so powerful machines, right? But it's so hard to buy those. I mean, these are 2.8 gigahertz dual processor machine, which is a fairly good machine. So you may not see a big difference, but you'll see some difference, right? And so you can, so what would, what is the driving force? Why do you decide to move it from running to um, ready state? Why do you, the, in, in terms of the hertz you have, right? Why would you choose to interrupt more often, why would it choose to interrupt less often? Say, so essentially, yeah. If you want the user to be able to still interact with the system. Mm -hmm. You would do what? Uh, you want it to interrupt more often. Yeah, so you want to interrupt more often because if you want to 
keep all of them thinking that they are making progress. Like if you have three process and you want each of them to think that they are making progress, or think, you know, be able to. So if you are in the running process, if you have only one processor, only one one process can be in the running state, right? Because you need the CPU. So if you have only one CPU, only one person can be in the running state. So if you want another pro pro program to get some uh, time, you have to move it into ready so you can get the other person to go, right? What's the, what's the bad stuff about doing this too, too often, right? Is there a reason why you don't want to do it too much? Every thousand times, or every ten thousand times, every million times, right? In a second, every million times, I make a decision whether you should go, right? Yeah. Because state switches are almost entirely overhead. Yes. So that's one thing we'll have to remember throughout the stuff, right? Whatever operating system does is overhead, including these movements around is overhead, right? You as a programmer do not care what I do, right? You really want all the time that the CPU has to be given to you as a user, right? So me deciding to get this interrupt and doing this stuff to move back and forth is all overhead, right? And that's the overhead that you're measuring in your, in your, in your, uh, in the, in the uh, example that for the homework project. And those you don't, you want to avoid that overhead, right? So if you keep it to the extreme, such a, so many times, essentially nobody does anything. Right? Everybody gets a little bit of share. So this is like me saying, okay. You answer, you answer, you answer, right? And I get you to say something within the time that I ask you, right? If I say, what's your name, 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 kind of stuff, right? If I go that fast, then you don't have a chance to say anything. So you just, right? You're, I get to go fast, but nothing really moves, right? You'd rather give enough time so people can do something. So you're trying to do a balance. And I hope you understand that that balance is no magic, right? When you do this project, sometimes you'll think that one is a better number, other is a better number. When you're building a kernel for Linux or Windows or what have you, there is no magic in number 100 is good, 10 is good, 1,000 is good. It depends on, again, on the situation. And that's the hard part, coming up with a good number. And companies like Microsoft spend lots of research trying to come up with a good number that'll, make, that'll keep the maximum number of people happy, right? So as you can imagine, some numbers are, will make 80% of you happy, right? And that number will make, let's say, 20% of you unhappy. And they have to, they're trying to figure out if that 80% is what, who they care, 20% is who they don't care, right? So as long as they can keep that happy, so it's all a trade-off, and there is no like one thing which says, this is the number you want to have, one optimal number or what have you, right? And so remember that, there's no good answer. It's all a, a trade-off. You need to understand why you're trading off some things. And also remember that all these things are overhead. All the things we, ta we, we do in the operating systems are overhead, right? So you're trying to do the minimal amount of stuff to get the maximum benefit. You don't want to go overboard and try to find an optimal stuff, right? So if you take a theory course, you'll, you'll learn about optimal scheduling, optimal stuff. We don't try to do those because we want to keep these things simple. We don't want to have some, you know, the operating system think for five hours and come up and say, the real optimal schedule for you is this, right? This is what you should do. Because whatever it's doing, it's wasted, right? And we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll stress that throughout when we, we go around, right? So don't, don't, we're not trying to make the operating system really smart. We're trying to make it as simple as possible, as fast as possible, as good as possible for the most number of people. And as you can imagine, it's not a trivial task, right? So anyway, so you have the, these different states. So from running to IO, it's entirely driven by your program, right? It's not done by the operating system. So if you ask for a keyboard input, then essentially you're going from running to, to a waiting state. In the waiting state, the operating system has a lot more control because you asked for it. You asked for an input output. So it can actually try to take away resources from you. It can take away, let's say you had access to a printer. While you're waiting for the keyboard, you can take the printer and give it to somebody else. Actually, printer does not make sense, but other resources, it can, it can do that, right? But when, you're, when you finish with the input output, or whatever you're waiting for, you go back to the ready state and wait to be scheduled to go running. So you keep going in this loop. When you ask for something in your program, it comes to a wait, uh, waiting state, wait for whatever input output you wanted, and then go back and then keep running, right? And over here, you have to have the processor. 
So depending on how many processes you have, right, that many processes can be running. If you have one processor, then only one process can be running. Right? And, and that's the state that these things go through. Right? So, so within the operating system, the notion of how to represent the process is through a memory data structure called process control block. Right? That's how it keeps track of this, this stuff. In fact, most of this stuff within the operating system has to be kept somewhere, right? It has to keep track of all these things. And PCB is the structure, right? It, it says who, what the process is. So it, it can have all the information about that process. It can keep the names, it can keep the state where it is. It can say whether it's running or whether it's waiting. And if it's waiting, waiting for what, right? It can keep whatever whatever uh, stuff you want in there, right? It can keep a list of open files. It can keep the program counter and register. Those are needed because when you go from running to wait state, you have to stop the process and then freeze its contents. So you have to remember what it was doing and before you let, uh, let it go, right? And this is a hardware feature that you want. So essentially, what it happens is if you're running in the CPU and I want to stop you, right, and I want to take the processor away from you, I have to store all the information that you are doing. I have to store all the contents you have in your registers and, and so on and so forth. I have to move it, store it somewhere, and then before I can run you, I have to restore all the stuff back. So you as a process do not know what happened, right? You are checking along, you are computing some numbers, and magically without you knowing, all your state is stored somewhere, the CPU is taken away from you, and then later on, the CPU, I mean, all the registers are put back, you're, you give the CPU and you made to go, right? And that's called process context switching. And that's essentially what you do from going from running to wait state, right? And this is something that is provided by the hardware. So when you take the hardware close, they tell you how exactly you would do those things, because you as application cannot know this is happening. And that requires hardware support, right? If you don't have hardware support, things may become a lot harder. Essentially, all those scratch space, you keep it in this process control block. So essentially, if you look at a process control block, the operating system can say exactly where, where you are, what you're doing, whether you're running. If you're not running, if you're in the wait state, what is the state of the, of the CPU that you were before you were the process was taken away from you? So before you can run, you can take this scratch space and make you run, right? So how big should this process control block be? Is there, should there be a limit on how big this should be? Is there, is there a reason why it should be very small? It should be as big to hold all the stuff you may want, right? It's a scratch space, so you can, you can whatever you want, you should have the stuff, right? Can you think of a reason why this should be not so big? Yes? It's sitting in memory. <laughs> yeah, again, it's an overhead, right? This is all operating system data structures, right? It needs all this stuff to keep track of what your process is running, right? But it shouldn't overdo it because all this is overhead, right? So if you, if you buy a laptop with, let's say, one gig of memory, right? And if you decide to allocate one megabyte for process control block, right? That means that one megabyte comes from your one gigabyte of memory, right? And, and we, later on we'll see we can push something to hard disk, but these things cannot be pushed to hard disk and so on. This has to be in the main memory because the kernel needs this, the operating system needs this to do what it has to do. So the bigger you make it, the more memory comes out of your own machine, right? And you don't want that. So you are trying to balance this stuff out, right? You're, Everything that we do is an is a overhead, so you want to avoid the overhead. So you don't want to just create, make this as big as possible, right? Because you can, because you know, it, it's, your, it's, 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 it's control of the operating system. But you want to keep it as small as possible so you don't waste too much space, right? So if you look at uh, memory statistics in your, operating, in your operating system, whatever machine you have, it'll tell you there's a kernel memory, you know, it, it may say what's the kernel memory, what's the user memory, what's buffers and all those things. And this is part of that kernel overhead, right? And nobody likes these things to be too big because it essentially goes away, right? Can you allow any process to manipulate the process control block if they so chose? Is there a reason why this should be inside the operating system kernel? Can this be 
something that any one of you can write a program to modify directly. How critical of a data structure do you think is a process control block for the proper functioning of a machine? You can try. Yes? Very important. Yes, it's, it's very important because this is this represents you to the operating system, right? So essentially, the notion of process control is it tells the operating system everything it needs to know about a process, which is essentially what you're interacting with, right? If, if, this, if something gets modified here, if something is not what it should be, then bad things can happen, right? If, so for example, if I, Operating system may decide that only one person should have the uh, particular hard, uh, ha hardware, right? So it can, it can maybe put a copy of that into this process because you happen to have this process at that time, right? If you, by accident or maliciously, also copy that information onto another, your, your another process, right? That means now operating system thinks that only one person should have this particular resource, but you, somehow made it, give it to two different processes, right? Because you corrupted this data structure, right? It's basically a table, right? You have a table of contents. So it says, this memory was given to you, this memory was given to you, right? And suppose you kind of go and message such that this memory happens to now look like it belongs to, to both of you, right? What would happen? You somehow did this. You somehow went inside the, you know, through the operating system, without telling the operating system, you did, you did this, right? What do you think would happen? You would have seen the artifacts of this. Most of you would have seen the artifacts of it, right? Which is operating systems are not designed to be very robust. They're not designed to check and recheck everything, right? Because if checking and rechecking takes processing, which is not, which you want to avoid. So it, it kind of assumes that it's supposed to be the way it is. If you corrupt these things, then your system will have to crash, right? You see a blue screen of death or, or, or whichever way it, it tells to you. But essentially it says, I know that only one person should have this resource. If you have two of those, chances are it does not know how to react. I mean, it does not care. It, it will do stuff which will, which will make this stuff messy, right? If you go ahead and, and corrupt this data structure, right? you will get a segmentation fault, right? So exam for example, if the memory limits is expected to be a pointer, and if you made it into a null pointer, you'll get a segmentation fault, right? Does it make sense for the operating system to have a segmentation fault? Like when you have a normal process, when you get, when you get an error, you get a segmentation fault. If in Unix, you get a code dump or, or some sort of a thing, right? What happens when there's a bug inside the operating system? What can it do? Yes? We just keep running and there's nobody watching it. Hmm? We just keep running and do whatever try to do because nobody's actually watching it. Yeah, but you can't go too far, right? If there's a, it, it'll keep running, right? Let, let's say it has a so null pointer. If change an address, it would change it regardless of whether it could or not. Yeah, but what will happen because of that? Uh, if it changed something that it shouldn't have, then Mm -hmm. Yeah, but is that? Uh, I thought you raised your hand. Okay. Um, so essentially, that's what happens, right? I mean, it'll start to do stuff, but what it cannot do is it cannot ask somebody for help. I mean, basically, segmentation fault is some sometime where it says uh, your process says. You know, some, for some reason you're trying to touch this variable, so you're, you're trying to modify something which you're not supposed to, right? Here, I'm going to kick you out of the system. You deal with it, right? The operating system cannot say, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, I'm getting an error because I'm, I'm accessing a memory which I'm not supposed to, but it can't ask anybody else because it is it, it is it, right? So, if it runs into that problem, then it has 
to crash. And the crash is what you usually see as a blue screen of death or whatever in the operating system, right? It'll basically, if you look at the stuff, it'll give you a stack trace. It says, this is what I was trying to do. I was trying to access this memory variable. How many of you have seen uh, blue screen of death? In, it happens in all operating systems, right? How many of you have seen those? Okay, um, so when you've seen it, have you like looked at what it, it was reporting, right? If you look at the trace of what it did, you can see what it was trying to do. And you, you may not understand what exactly was happening, but you can see a thing of, it'll, it'll tell you that I was trying to do this, but I couldn't proceed because something was not right, right? And one way to do that is to manipulate this structure because it, it, it does not, you know, this, is, this is crucial to who you are. If you try to manipulate this or other data structures within the, within the kernel, then bad things will happen because it does not know how to react and it'll crash, right? And if it doesn't crash, if it does proceed, then it'll do stuff that you don't expect, right? For example, it can do something. So since it, it is the stuff, right, it can maybe let him modify your memory, modify your what you're going to write and all those things because it can write whatever it wants, right? So it's a dangerous thing for it to let learn loose and you know, do whatever it wants, right? So you don't want normal people to have access to this. This is a very protected data structure. So you only get access to it through system calls, right? Have you, have you looked into what this is in, in any of your, like when you use a computer, have you ever looked at what's the status of the process control block? You might have, right? If you are using Linux and stuff, if you do a PS or top or any of those commands, that's basically what they're doing. They basically ask the kernel, give me all the statistics you have, and it'll give you some other stuff, right? Here, uh, let me show you how it'll look like in Windows. So when you look at a task manager, right, in Windows, you, you, uh, you look at it through a task manager. So in this, um, so within the, can you see it in the back, right? So within task manager, it will let you show a lot of statistics about processes, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff. So for example, it can say, I want to look at the, the CPU time, right? Which means that this GUI application is showing you that there are all these different processes, right? And these are the names that, that uh, the, the system knows about. And these are some of the stuff it knows about, right? Who's running it? and how much CPU is allocated to it, what CPU time, memory usage, and so on and so forth. And we'll see what those are as you move along. But essentially, all the statistics are part of the process control block, right? So this application is asking the kernel, tell me all the stuff that I need to know so I can display this stuff, right? It does not let you know all the things that the kernel knows. It only tells you some of the stuff that you need to debug your program, right? This is a good tool for you to see what is happening in your system, but essentially what it does is it does a system call to find all the PCB data structures, components that you need to know, right? It does not, for example, tell you how much memory was, what memory was allocated to you, because that's of no use to you, right? It wants to tell you how much memory is given to you, so you can say, oh, you know, the particular, um, whatever the PowerPoint is using about four megs of memory, Maybe a good thing or a bad thing, so you can make decisions on what to do. Right? And and this is I mean, you see similar stuff on other operating systems too. Uh, PS is one of the ones in uh, Unix-based systems. Right? So that's the that's notion of the password control block, which, which holds all this information. And so this one tells you pictorically what happens when you do this moving from running to wait state, right? which is also called the context switch, because you're switching the context of a process from running to wait state. right? So what you have to do is, suppose you're running one process, and suppose you're running another process simultaneously, which of course you can't do because there's only one processor, one, one CPU. So the way we do that is to do a context switch by moving one from running to wait state, another one from waiting to run state, so that both of them look like they are sort of running, right? So if we decide to stop this process and start to run this process, right, at some point, the operating system 
will wake up with the timer, which is what you're manipulating for your homework project one, right? And it'll decide that this process has to go to sleep and this has to be woken up, right? So the first thing you'll do is you'll have to do this hardware mechanism to save all your state, right? Save all your state may mean that saving all the state that you left in the processor, which may include where you are in the program execution, what was in your registers, and anything else that the hardware, the processor needs, right? All the state that the processor knew about you would have to be stored into the PCB of this process, right? And you have to restore all the stuff that was in the PCB of this process into the processor and let it go, right? Again, this is not done by the operating system. You need the hardware support. The operating system provides a memory where you can store these contents, but the exact instructions on how this context switch happens depends on the particular hardware, right? Because we can't we can't really do this in the in the software. And if you take a uh, if you look at the different like you know Intel machine or Power PC or what have you, they have different ways of doing the stuff, and they have different stuff which needs to be stored. And once it does this magic instruction to say run, right? What happens is your processor, which used to have all the state of the old process, would have been replaced with this one. So when it starts to run, this program will have no clue that it was stopped for a while, because all, everything else is the same, so it can continue. And at some point, when you do the, you know, go back to this process, you can't really tell this switch happened, because when you were running, all the CPU looked the same. At some point, you were yanked out and, and a new one was moved in, right? This is, happens to you all the time. When you're running a your process, you keep context switching throughout the space. So you're running PowerPoint, you can go to another one, all those things. If you do it fast enough, you don't notice this stuff. Is there a way for you to detect this in a normal machine? You can't do this from within your program. Within your program, it looks like you had the CPU all the time. Yes? Can't you access like a CPU scanner to know how long it's been on? And then you can constantly store the state to see if it's moved up since the last time you were looked at? Yes, you, you can. The U depends on who U is, right? You can't do this as application. Okay. Unless you, so you can do this as application if you have access to a wall clock time, right? So. If you have wall clock time, you can say, I start this program, which is what you do for the project. Right? You, can, you can look at the wall clock time when you started. You can look at the wall clock time when you stop. None of this will affect the wall clock time. right? So if, if I, I started the time there, it looked like it was 10 o'clock. And when I came here, it was 10.01. Then you can deduce that I didn't actually do anything, but the time has moved by one second. right? But within the system, only the operating system can know all the stuff. You can't measure this yourself. right? Anything you do, will be frozen and given back to you. So you have to use another reference clock to make this stuff, right? So if you, if you write programs to look at the wall clock time, you can see how much time you actually ran. If you look at the, the, system, the time that was allocated to you, it'll be the same regardless of how many times you have context switched, right? Because it, it, you shouldn't know that this is being done to you, right? It's being done by the operating system, not by you. So you should not know how many times you have context switched, how, many, how, many, how much time you you know how much time you got to run, but not how many times you interrupted in, in the middle, right? Except for the for the time, right? You would notice it sometime, right? When, you, when your machine is like extremely slow, your PowerPoint may look like it's taking forever to run, right? Or if you again, if you go not to the good machines, but if you have a older machine, right? Try to run lots of stuff. Try to run a PowerPoint and Word and Excel and Access and whatever you can think of, right? The machine will look like it's slow, right? That's because it's doing all this context switch. Each of the process gets the same amount of CPU, regardless of how many applications you run. But your wall clock time gives you an indication that something is slow, right? Make sense? So you don't want, so you don't want, so you have all these different queues. You have to keep track of all this different stuff. So you have this note, this PCB. And you, you, you send the pointer to this PCB to the different stuff. So you, within your operating system, you have lots of these queues, right? Which essentially mean that somebody keeps track of where your process is at this point, right? So for example, there may be a queue for the disk, there may be a queue for keyboard and what have you. So if a process goes into IO wait, right? 
you will send a pointer for the PCB to the keyboard controller. So it'll keep it in its own queue, which it'll manage in some fashion. It may be a priority queue, it may be a first in, first out, it may be whatever data structure you can imagine. But essentially, it'll know what process is waiting for that particular stuff. So the keyboard can say, I know this process is waiting for me, this process is waiting for me. So when the I.O. finishes, the keyboard controller can pick this process, change its state right, to whatever it wants to be, and move it into the wait queue. Right? So you have this data structure, but pointers to it keeps moving around. Right? So it can be moved between the run and wait queue, or it can be made to move to the um, I.O. wait queues for the different uh, I.O. operations. Right? So the, the operating system is simple because it has this one table that you're manipulating all the time. It's also complex because if you have any of these code, bug in any of these code, right? So for example, if the, the terminal unit, when it sees this PCB, it corrupted this PCB, right? Instead of writing one, it wrote a two or something, right? And it sends it back to the operating system, right? Back to the, to the running process, right? You will fail again much later, right? So when you think about the modular way of building operating systems, where these were done as modules or device drivers that you loaded, right? you have to be careful on corrupted operating system, then the whole thing will come crashing down. Right? And that's one of the ways that most operating systems are brought down. If any of the data structures inside the operating system is corrupted, it's really bad. And especially when you begin to trust all these device drivers to manipulate all these structures, they need to manipulate the structures because they, that's where their job is. But if any one of them make a mistake, then things will crash. Right? You can try this on the, on the machine by randomly going to some uh, module, um, changing the PCB entry to something else. Right? You'll see the machine will, will crash spectacularly or not in weird places. Debugging that is really horrendously hard. Right? And in many of the operating systems, if you keep running them for longer and longer, the chance of you failing goes up. Right? So if you, most of the machines, when you boot up, they tend to run fine, right? But after running for a while, right? After running for a year or so, right? All these little bugs tend to accumulate and then it tends to crash. How many of you notice that? If you keep running for a while, then suddenly something fails. Like if you start PowerPoint, you've been doing this every day for the last week, and this time you start PowerPoint, PowerPoint will fail, right? Or whatever application will fail. How many of you notice those? Like seemingly out of the blue, seemingly unexplainably weird. And you reboot the machine, most of the time it'll be fixed, right? So what do you think rebooting fixes everything? How many of you notice that rebooting fixes all life's problem? Yes? Yeah, you use you, you restarting everything, right? And you hope that the restart would flush out all the stuff. You don't know what, what happened, but Hopefully, you're creating new PCBs, and hopefully, it'll be fine, right? Um, so, so that's that's the magic. Right? Reboot fixes everything because there's a bug. Debugging a bug within operating system is very hard, but that usually fixes, and you're kind of okay, right? So, within if you're if you're a company like Microsoft, and you say, "I've been running the machine for a month, it works fine," and then I have to reboot, they say, "Okay, fine, do that. We don't have to worry about that, right?" If you take if you run for five minutes, and then you have to reboot, that's not a good thing. Month, it's it's okay, right? And one of the other things you may notice is there are some operations that you do which tends to make this problem, right? How many of you use hibernate or sleep on your machines? So what would have to happen when you hibernate? Yes? It's uh, writing the contents of memory to disk. Yeah. That, so that's how it will go to hibernate, right? It will write the contents into somewhere, right? To come out of the hibernation, what would it have to do? opposite, right? But, but the problem with the opposite is you will have to shut down the hardware, right? So some of the things are easy to come back up, like a CPU can be made to come back and start running immediately. There are some hardware which has to be restarted and brought back up, right? For example, your screen, right? Your screen cannot come back up, it has to reset, it has to start back up again. For example, your CD player, right? Your CD player, if you're reading somewhere in the middle, it, you wouldn't have left it reading like that. So you have to start back, you know, start the hardware again, then move this arm to where you thought it should be, and then let it go, right? 
So the restart on the hardware depends on what the hardware can do. Some hardware is easy, some hardware is not easy, right? For example, for a printer, right? It can't restart from where it left off because things might have happened. So when you do a hibernation wake up, sometimes you notice that the system will crash. How many of you notice that hibernation does not work all the time? If it does work for you all the time, then you're very lucky, right? So for people who didn't notice things work all the time, where do you see the problem happen? How many of you have figured out what fails? Yes? Okay. It's usually the input output devices, wireless cards, and, and the screens to me seems to be like the, the major stuff, right? If you're using some complex stuff, when you come back, you sometimes your laptop will be fine. You can remote log in through SSH if you have one of those. And everything looks fine except your screen has no display, right? And the only way to do that is to reset the graphics card, which you can't do because the only time operating systems reset the graphics card is when you reboot, right? So you'll have to reboot even though your machine looks like it's running. And essentially, these are all the same kinds of issues. You are trying to stop and restart. Within the process, we know how to do it well, because otherwise, you won't be able to use a machine. But hibernation brings another issue, but essentially, it's sort of the same later stuff. Right? Yeah, and I'll give a little bit of, of what, what schedulers are. We'll, we'll see a lot more as we move along in this thing. So essentially, once we have this notion of processes and stuff, schedulers are essentially trying to figure out what should go first? The general, general notion of scheduling is essentially if you have three or four which are waiting for something, how do I create some sort of a schedule on who should go first, right? So if, if three processors are waiting for a keyboard to figure out who should get the, the keyboard first, if three are waiting for printers and, and what have you, right? And that's the problem of scheduling. Within process scheduling, which is the first module, we are trying to look to see who should get the CPU first, right? When we when you look at I/O scheduling, we'll see who should get the hard disk first, and so on, right? So here there are two notions. One is a long-term and a short-term scheduler. Long-term scheduler will decide whether a process should be let into a system at all. It's looking at the long-term goal of the system. It's seeing that system is like very slow because whatever who is in, in there needs to be um, are, are destroying the system. So it can decide that in the long term, it's in our best interest not to let somebody else in. The short term does not care about the long term. It only looks at, I have three processes which are in the wait queue, who should run, right? And in typical system, you have a combination of both. You have a combination of long term and short term outlook, right? The long term one can actually think for a while to decide what should happen. The short term one should be as fast as possible. It's all overhead, right? So if you have two processes waiting, they're both ready to go. You want the OS to be as quick as possible to send one from one to the other. Right? So the short term has to be very fast because it's overhead. Long term is also overhead, but you hope that it's making such a wise decision, you may want to let some of these things go. Um, and th that's the notion of, and the other two stuff is, if you have a process which is always using I.O., you call it I.O. bound. Other one is called CPU bound. And we'll see what that means, how it happens for a scheduler, actually in a couple of lectures. But essentially, that's the notion of a scheduler. right? And we're sort of out of time. Um, We'll continue with the processes and move on to the notion of threads in the next lecture. Thanks.